Well, good morning. Glad you're back with me. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that starts at verse 23 this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. Several years ago, Vicki and I went on a cruise, and I like them. Uh, we both do, actually. We like to take cruises. Even though we've had some pretty exciting um, adventures on a cruise ship, I guess, and not necessarily in a good way, some of the experiences uh, would probably lead most people to stop going on cruises, but I would get on another one tomorrow. It's I've uh, just always had a lot of fun. One cruise, though, was especially eventful. We have uh, we have only been on cru one cruise, I think, in all of the, the the few that we have taken, where the water was perfectly calm and it was like sl slithering across a piece of glass in a giant ship. But this time, it was it, the seas were pretty rough. There was a storm out east of us in the Gulf, and uh, it was stirring up the water pretty good and. We took a tour of the ship and we actually were able to go to the bridge and see where they were piloting the ship and a uh, really unique experience. And while there, I was talking to one of the men there on the bridge and I said, how tall do you think those waves are? They, they look to me to be like five or six feet. And he said, oh no, no, those, those are more like 15 feet. And by the way, they're getting worse and it's going to get worse through the night. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. And Later that day, we for that evening, we found ourselves on the deck and we watched the swimming pool empty itself of water, literally from the ship rocking the water out of the swimming pool. It was uh, it was quite quite the thing to see. the The bow of the ship would slap the waves, kind of like a boat going across a lake, and it would send shudders uh, down through the ship, and and it was it was rocking end to end and side to side and. I'm just telling you, it was it was quite the ride. It, it, it seemed like the only people that thought it felt normal were the drunks, you know. I guess because they were used to bouncing off the walls and falling down. I, I don't know, but no one could walk straight. We ran into crew members, and these are people that live on a ship, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and and they were sick because of the motion, and and so it was uh, it was it was quite interesting there were people that were putting on their life vests and looking to go to the lifeboats and i'm going to tell you if i was given a choice in that sea i would stay on the big ship rather than a little boat but i digress the spray of the seas coming off the ship when it would hit a wave reached our balcony on the 10th deck and yes i was stupid enough to go out there and and feel the spray I, we we had to turn sideways in our bed to sleep so that we wouldn't get tossed out of bed. Yeah, it was an adventure, no no doubt. It was like getting on a roller coaster and staying on it for you know four or five hours, maybe six. It was uh, <laughs> it was I loved it, absolutely loved it, enjoyed it immensely. Now most people would say that that's a terrible experience. Why would you ever get on another cruise ship? Well. You know, I, I never considered the possibility that we were really in danger. Maybe that's stupid. I, I trusted the captain. And as misplaced as that trust may have been, I, I really did. I trusted his experience and his skill and his decisions to guide the ship safely through the storm and the rough seas to we would find a place of safety, some port, somewhere, sometime. Now, he was on the same ship I was, and so I knew that he was going to do everything in his power to, to make sure that the ship didn't falter, and so I trusted him. I wish I could say I had that kind of trust in Jesus all the time, and when we face storms of life, sometimes we don't place our faith correctly in the one who we know who can calm the storm. Our experiences are sometimes filled with fear and we seem to forget easily that we followed Jesus into this storm. If we were following him to start with, we followed him right into the storm. And so our passage this morning kind of tells that story. And so let's read it together. Matthew chapter eight, beginning at verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, you have little faith, 
Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for being the one who sent your son to this planet so that we could see his example and understand his power. God, I pray that we will indeed trust Jesus enough, even in the storms, to realize that he will see us through. Father, I pray that as we walk through this passage this morning, that we will gain insight into ourselves, maybe some introspection so that we can understand where we are before you today. And God, I pray that we will devote our lives to following Jesus just as the disciples did when he got in the boat. Father, help us to see today. Help us to hear. Help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. In light of the conversations that Jesus had just before getting on the boat, I, I think we need to, to make sure that verse 23 is not lost on us. You see, verse 23 is the part of this passage that we just kind of read right past. and We don't pay much attention to it, but, but think about it. I want you to think about it really solidly. Jesus got in the boat, and the disciples followed. Now, that's a simple little verse, just a couple of different phrases that are put together. And the, for the record, it's what disciples do. Jesus goes somewhere, they follow him. He goes, they go. Wherever he goes, they go. We see this over and over until they get to Jerusalem. And, and then from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit all the way to the end, we see that the disciples are following Jesus to the very best of their ability most of the time. When he moves, they go. When he says go, they go. It, it's just what disciples do. They had witnessed miracles. They'd seen what a real relationship with God was supposed to look like because Jesus modeled it for them. They saw Jesus pray and knew that they needed to pray. And this time, they saw him get in the boat. It was a planned adventure, by the way. It's not like they just kind of happened into the boat or anything. Back in verse 18 of, of chapter 8 of Matthew, the Bible says when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And so they knew they were getting in the boat, probably a fishing boat. I mean, it would make the most sense based on who Jesus' disciples were and the makeup of the lake. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that there were usually more than 300 fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee at one time. And the boat had to be big enough for at least 12 disciples. According to Mark's gospel, it was evening. So that wasn't a problem for a seasoned fisherman to go out in the evening and stay at night or even overnight. John's gospel records for us that Jesus, after Jesus was crucified, Peter said, I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. The next morning they had an encounter with Jesus. And so everything about this event is pointing to normal, natural, maybe even routine. These men got in a boat at night and they're gonna sail across the Sea of Galilee. Now it's not the biggest lake on the planet. It's, uh, it's, it's got some dimensions that would surprise you, but I think the disciples didn't think twice about this. They were committed followers of Jesus. Jesus gets in a boat, we get in a boat. Not to revisit last week's sermon, but I want to know where we are in all of this. I'm suggesting that in order to follow Jesus, you have to have your eyes on Jesus. You need to be looking for him in every opportunity that you have. We have to listen to Jesus and hear him, believe him, be committed to him like the disciples were. Most of the time, it's really easy. I mean, sometimes it's routine, simple, um, maybe even a habit. I mean, why are you listening to me right now? Did you follow Jesus to this Facebook video or YouTube video just to hear what I had to say today? 
I mean, I enjoy your company as much as I enjoy spending time with anyone else. But in full disclosure, I did not follow you here, and I pray that you did not follow me here. Matthew um, 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there I am with them. And so we understand that when we gather together in a church setting or we gather together and even watch a sermon online or something, there's two or three of us gathered in the name of Jesus, and that means he's there. And so wherever Jesus goes, the disciple goes. It's really that simple. If you don't have your eyes on Jesus, then you're not going to know where to go. If you're not listening to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as a believer, then you're not going to know where to go. If you're not a believer and don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you're not going to know where to go. It's that simple. Make your own decisions. Follow your own heart. Live your dream, someone might say. Well, for me, I want to follow Jesus, even if he gets in a boat, even if it's at night. Now, I recognize that we don't have the person of Jesus Christ in bodily form to follow around in the world today. But as true believers, the, we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. And if you believe in the triune God, if you believe and accept Jesus Christ as God's Son, the suffering servant, the Messiah from heaven, then you have no one to follow but yourself if you don't believe. Believers experience the guiding presence of God in their lives. And the truth is, we'll follow to the end no matter what the cost, no matter what comes next. But the distractions are real. Verse 24 says, Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. For some of us, this is a very familiar story. If you've been in church all your life, like me, you've heard this story over and over and over. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this preached and taught. Mark taught it not long ago in our Sunday evening Bible studies in his study of Jesus' miracles. Did a great job with it, by the way. We hear this story if we're exposed to the church environment, and it's popular because we have seasons of storms. The most practical way to handle this passage is by emphasizing Jesus' salvation from the storm his calming of the storm. It's the easy sermon because every believer has been with Jesus in a storm. And many believers have come out of a storm that Jesus has calmed. And so it's, it's, a, it's a simple sermon to preach, but I want us to back up a little bit and take a, a little different look. You see, Jesus got in the boat and the disciples followed and then all hell broke loose. I mean, I, don't, I really don't know any other way to say it. Without warning, a storm brewed. The Sea of Galilee is not a large body of water. I mentioned that its dimensions might surprise you. It's 13 miles long, 7 miles wide, but it is 150 feet deep. The shoreline is 680 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by mountains, and those mountains can cause the winds to swirl and storms to form rather quickly and unexpectedly, and oftentimes they're they're ferocious. For comparison, those of you that are around here, you might have been to Lake Texoma. It's about 30 miles long and 10 miles wide, has a maximum depth of just over 100 feet. And how many of us have been caught in a storm on that lake? And I have. Because of the Sea of Galilee's unique properties, the storms were fierce, sudden, and dangerous. Oh yeah, and did I, did I mention it's night? <laughs> well, the storm comes. It rolls in unexpectedly, fiercely, dangerously. The storms, it's, I'm not gonna park on this storm very long because it, you know it's what most people do when they preach on this sermon, but the truth is storms happen. It's a fact of life. Believer or not, storms happen to everybody. They generally surprise us. They sneak up on us. It's not something so, oh, look at that storm way off over there. I'll just wait till it gets here and then everything will be okay. It's, it's not the way storms work in our lives most of the time. They give us 
trouble without warning. What happens in this boat, though, is what I want us to really see. Jesus is asleep. Now, that's really not surprising to me. And, and probably, you know, if you think about it, it, it won't be surprising to you. Jesus is fully God and he's fully human. He has been surrounded by throngs of people and they have gathered around him and he is tired. He is worn out. He, he needs a rest. His schedule is overrun with very needy people. And everybody wants something from him. He just needed a rest, and so he fell asleep. But then the waves are sweeping over the boat. Now, modern fishing boats, you know, they have, they have mechanisms for dealing with water that inundates a vessel, and these, these guys didn't. They do not have Coast Guard approved flotation devices. They don't have lifeboats, not that either of those would have helped. And they are convinced that this is the end for them. Now, they're going, to, they're going to meet with the most terrifying of deaths, in my opinion, drowning. That's what they think. And these aren't casual thoughts, by the way. These are seasoned professionals. This is their professional assessment of an actual circumstance. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. It's, it's not a guess. They knew from all of their experience as fishermen that this was an inescapable demise. And so what do they do? They wake Jesus up. <laughs> had an interesting thought about this Friday. I was traveling to a site to work on some equipment and a friend was with me and we were just kind of discussing what he was going to preach Sunday and what I was going to preach Sunday and we started talking about this, this passage and, and this thought popped in my head and I thought, you know, the disciples, they woke Jesus up but it wasn't because they were concerned for him. I mean, they were wide awake. They saw the storm. They were afraid of the storm. They knew the intensity of the storm. They knew everything about it. But they didn't wake Jesus up because they were concerned for his safety. They woke him up because they were concerned for their own safety. See, I think we find ourselves in a similar situation right now, today. We look around us and we see wars and attacks and all different kinds of things happening. We have a presidential election coming up in November and we don't know what the outcome of that's going to look like. And the honest truth is we don't know what any of the outcomes of any of the circumstances of life are really going to be. And we look in our bank accounts and the expenses are high and the income is low and all of this is just completely out of our control. We don't have anything that we can do about it. And we are acting like the disciples. We look at it and we, we think, well, this is the end. We're wringing our hands in worry and uh, our assessment of all of this just looks bad. We cannot envision any possible positive outcome. And I'll, honestly, I don't know how the, all this goes, but I do know how it ends. Wars are going to stop and start up again. Economies will change. In November, we will get the government that we deserve, according to the Apostle Paul. That's the way I read that passage of Scripture, by the way. And don't forget, the Israelites got the government they deserved quite often. Sometimes it was Babylonians. <laughs> Jesus can make the worst possible situation work out. In verse 26, we read, he replied, you have little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, now we know the deal here, Jesus calmed the storm. But before he calmed the storm, before he rebuked the winds and the waves, he rebuked the disciples. You see, calming the storm really isn't the point here. Now, yes, it's a miracle. And yes, it is a miracle performed by Jesus Christ himself in front of people. And yes, they learned something from it. But he, the, he showed his power to overcome nature. He saved the disciples from their certain death, at least in their minds. And 
there's beyond a multitude of possible applications to Jesus calming the storm, but why do we blow past this rebuke like it didn't happen? Rebuke is the right description, by the way. Jesus said to them is an accurate translation, but the context says it was a reprimand. It, I can imagine Jesus saying some different kinds of things, maybe like, you woke me up to do something, didn't you? <laughs> You're just like everyone else. You didn't wake me up out of concern for my safety. Even if you were waking me up so I wouldn't drown in my sleep, it wasn't out of care for me. So why? Why did you wake me up? The answer is pretty simple. They were afraid. They were being driven by fear to do something. Fear was leading them to make decisions. Fear was the sole guiding force in their life at that moment. But all Jesus wanted was for them to trust him. In faith, trust him. Even before the storm was calmed, he wanted them to trust him. But all they could muster was fear. So what are you afraid of right now? What fear is driving your actions and inactions? There's something that you've been thinking about for days, maybe weeks, longer. It's driving you crazy. It's increasing your anxiety. Maybe you've even lost sleep over it. Let me be the first to confess my fear. You see, I've followed Jesus into this boat of life, and I fear bad things are going to happen or that they're already happening. I'm letting that fear drive my actions and inactions, not completely, but enough to lose some sleep, to feel stress, to be anxious. I mean, how many of you can relate to that? All Jesus wants for me is to trust him. Jesus got in a boat. His disciples followed. I'm going to say that it's time that we trust Jesus' lead. That should really be the end of it, no matter what happens, whether the storm comes or the storm doesn't come, that we follow Jesus. I'm not surprised, by the way, that the disciples were surprised when Jesus calmed the storm. You see, they learned something new about Jesus that night. They learned that even he had control over nature. Storms obey him. Jesus deserves our trust. No matter what life throws our way. Again, I don't know how this plays out, but I do know how it ends. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Trust in Jesus will absolutely see us through to the end. And our actions show our trust. Wherever you are today, in your journey through life, in your um, experience with Jesus as Savior, what it, if you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus as Savior, that's the first step in this journey. Accept Jesus for who he is. Realize that he's God's son and he died on the cross for your sins. Accept him and place your faith and your trust in him. Just like the disciples did. They had to learn it. It was rough. It was rocky. There were storms. But they did place their faith and trust in Jesus. For those of us who have accepted Christ, I don't know what you're facing in your life right now. But I suspect there are some things that seem like fierce, terrible, sudden storms. And I know that Jesus can calm them, but before he calms them, we really need to trust him. Yes, it's easy to trust after the storm is calmed, but to trust before, that's a big, good deal more challenging. But that's what Jesus wants, for us to trust him. In faith, trust him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for allowing us an opportunity to place our faith and trust in him as Savior and Lord. 
And God, I know that sometimes we get caught up in our fears. And they drive us to the point where we can't see, hear, or even follow Jesus where he wants to lead us. And so, Father, I pray that you will help to calm them. That you will find ways to pour out peace so that we can see clearly where Jesus is going so that we might follow. Father, I thank you for the love that you've shown us. And I pray that if we have fear at all, it will be the fear that throws us into your arms, not that drives us away. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and your son, Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. And I appreciate you joining me. It's always fun to have uh, people watch, and I know that you do. Uh, We'd love to see you in person. Come visit us sometime here in Darty, would you? You have a great week.